Hello everyone. This is SK Mehta, presently the president of the Indian Nuclear Society called INS. I wish to welcome you all to this INS series lectures. This series about uh, 13 lectures is aimed to acquaint you with the various aspects of the nuclear energy its utilization in various areas benefiting humanity, the limitations and the regulatory aspects in safety and protection. One of the main objectives of the INS is to promote the advancement of nuclear science and engineering and technology related to the atomic nucleus and the allied sciences and arts. With this objective, INS has been disseminating information through journals, books, reports, newsletters, seminars, and conferences. These have mainly been to keep the INS members and other scientific communities and organizations well informed about the development in the various areas of science and technology within India and world over. Or it is realized that there is a need to keep the various professionals, undergraduate students, and general public knowledgeable in their respective fields of nuclear science and engineering. For the benefit of, uh, of the public, some of the important and the common application of nuclear being for power, industrial use, medical diagnosis and treatment, agriculture, food preservation, and various other areas. This lecture series is made in simple language and illustration with the aim to inform the general viewer about the science, engineering, and technology, social benefits of the nuclear, application of nuclear carrier benefits in nuclear and regulatory and safety of the nuclear energy. The presentations are prepared and narrated by experts on each topic in a way that the viewers with no background knowledge about the nuclear science and engineering can understand. Our effort will be to constantly provide information about newer benefits to the society emerging out of the pain-taking research and nuclear science and engineers. Viewers are encouraged to comment, suggest, and put forward question to the experts. The channel of the constructive communication will always be open in INS, which is website ins-india.org. All these lectures will cover different aspects of nuclear energy in sectors like power, medicine, agriculture, and society. It illustrates in simple way the science behind nuclear reactors for all of us. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Sudarshan and I will be talking about fundamentals of atomic nucleus. In this lecture, I will be talking about the concept of atomic nucleus, binding energy, and how the Variations in binding energy influence the radioactive decay, the energy released in nuclear fusion and fission processes. In case of any doubts on this lecture, you can post me at sudarshankatti at gmail.com or contact me via Indian Nuclear Society. Let's start with the concept of atom and nucleus. Matter around us is made up of atoms. For a long time, atoms were considered to be indivisible, homogeneous particles. But then the discovery of electron by J.J. Thomson has changed this understanding and electrons were negatively charged and 2000 times lighter than the hydrogen. To accommodate these electrons, the atomic model was modified and then came the Thomson plum pudding model. According to this model, atom had negatively charged electrons embedded within the 
positively charged soup and this positively charged soup is responsible for the mass of the atom. Let's have a look at the other discoveries that happened around the time of discovery of electrons that helped us in our understanding of the atom better. The first one is X-rays by Roentgen. When he was studying whether the cathode rays could pass through glass, a mysterious light that passes through most substances but leaves shadows of solid objects was discovered and the light was named as X-rays. Further, Henry Beckler discovered radioactivity where some salts emit rays which blacken the photographic plate and one of the rays emitted is helium 2 plus are also called as alpha rays and these helium plus 2 rays have a profound influence on current understanding of the structure of the atom and they were the integral part of the next path changing experiment on the structure of the atom which we see in the next slide. Rutherford scattering experiment is the big experiment that changed our understanding of the structure of the atom. Rutherford was trying to understand the scattering of the alpha particles that were emitted by the radioactive sources from gold foil. He collimated the alpha energetic alpha particles onto the gold foil and the angular distribution of the scattered particles was measured using scintillation screen. Most of the alpha particles passed through but a few scattered at very large angle. The scattering at large angle was quite unexpected. It was quite the most incredible event. It was almost as surprising as if a gunner fired a shell at a piece of tissue paper and the shell bounced back. How do we explain this large angle scattering by few high energy alpha particles? Let's try to understand the implications of the Rutherford scattering experiment. Had the Thomson model which assumes that both positive charge and mass of the atom is distributed over the entire volume of the atom is true, all the energetical alpha particles are expected to simply pass through the gold file. But the actual observations that a small fraction of the alpha particles have backscattered while majority of them pass through implies that most of the space in the atom is empty and mass of the atom is concentrated in a small region in the center of the atom and it is also called as nucleus and this nucleus is also positively charged and the dimension of the nucleus to the dimension of atom is of the order of 10 to the power of minus 4 or nucleus at the center of an atom is similar to a football at the center of football ground. Overall, atoms have protons in the nucleus in the center of the atom and equal number of electrons outside. But mass of the many nuclei is more than that could be accounted for by the number of protons alone. Hence, initially it was proposed that either nucleus could have neutral particles of the mass of equivalent protons or more number of electrons and protons in the nucleus to account for the mass. But the discovery of neutron by Chadwick has unequivocally proved that nucleus contains both protons which are positively charged and neutrons which are neutral but has mass equivalent to proton. To summarize, atom is of the size of 10 to the power of minus 8 centimeters whereas the nucleus in the center of the atom is 10,000 times smaller. This nucleus contains the almost all the mass of the atom and it is made up of neutrons and protons and the outer region of the nucleus in the atom contains the electrons. Neutrons and protons can be further made up of quarks which is not concerned now and neutrons, protons and electrons have definitive mass and which are given in atomic mass units here and also in terms of MEV. One atomic mass unit is equivalent to 1 by 12th of the mass of carbon 12 or in terms of energy one atomic mass unit is equivalent to 931.5 MeV as per the Einstein mass energy relation. You can see that neutron and proton are much more massive when compared to the electron and since the nucleus is made up of neutron and proton and only electrons are present outside the nucleus, the entire mass of the atom is concentrated in the nucleus of the 
atom. Nucleus consists of protons, neutrons and these protons and neutrons together are called nucleons. The number of protons is also called as atomic number whereas the number of nucleons is called as mass number. A nucleus can be uniquely denoted with all these three. However, since the chemical symbol is unique for each atomic number, quite often all the neutron number, proton number and atomic number are not mentioned but only mass number is mentioned with the chemical symbol. For example, if it is denoted as 235 uranium, since the chemical symbol U is used for uranium and it is definitive that atomic number of the nucleus that we are talking about is 92 corresponding to uranium and also the neutron number is the mass number minus the atomic number. Similarly, uranium 238. Whenever the chemical symbol is used, the mention of mass number itself gives the unique identity of the nucleus whereas the chemical symbol is not used but any random symbol like X is used all the numbers neutron number proton number and atomic number are always mentioned let us go through the terminology used in classification of the nuclei isotopes isotopes are the nuclei having the same atomic number hence chemically same but differ in their mass number for example hydrogen deuterium tritium are isotopes to each other isobars are the nuclei having the same mass number or the nuclear number but differ in their atomic number for example argon 40 potassium 40 calcium 40 are isobars to each other isotones are the nuclei which have same number of neutrons and their arrangement but differ in their mass number and hence the total nuclear number 2. For example, sodium 23 and magnesium 24 have 12 number of neutrons in them. And the last class is nuclear isomers are the nuclei which have the same number of neutrons and also the same number of protons. But the internal arrangement of the neutrons and protons is different that they are different in terms of their total energy or one of them is ground state, the other could be excited state. These are called the nuclear isomers. I have mentioned earlier that the size of the nucleus is roughly 10,000 times smaller when compared to the size of the atom. Now let us try to see how this can be measured. When we bombard nucleus with a charged particle, the distance from which the charged particle can get scattered depends on the kinetic energy of this positively charged projectile. And at the distance of closest approach, the energy of the particle will be equal to the Coulombic repulsion between the nucleus and the positively charged particle. So to measure the size of the nucleus, the actual experiment done is to measure the scattered alpha particle intensity as a function of energy at any fixed angle. And the scattering intensity of alpha particle as a function of energy is expected to vary proportional to 1 by kinetic energy square. But when the distance of closest approach approaches the nuclear dimension, the scattering intensity falls off. So we note down the energy at which this deviation from the actual scattering expected is appearing. And this based on this energy, we can estimate the size of the nucleus as shown in the next slide. At the distance of closest approach, kinetic energy is equivalent to Coulombic repulsion between the alpha particle and the nucleus. And since we have already noted down the kinetic energy at which the deviation from the expected scattering intensity is starting, using that kinetic energy, the minimum distance between the projectile alpha particle and the nucleus can be estimated and this distance gives the nuclear force radii or the radius of the nuclei. The radius of various nuclei have been measured using the similar approach and it has been found that radius of all the nuclei vary as cube root of mass number and this proportionality constant which relates the radius with the cube root of mass number varies among all the nuclei between 1.2 to 1.5 Fermi and 1 Fermi is 10 to the power of 15 meter. So if the radius varies as cube root of 
mass number it means the volume of the nuclei varies as mass number assuming that the nucleus is spherical hence the volume of the nucleus will be 4 by 3 pi r cube now let us see how does the density of the nucleus vary density of the nucleus is mass of the nucleus by volume of the nucleus and mass can be approximated as the mass number into mass of the proton and volume again is proportional to mass number hence the density of the nucleus is independent of the mass number or the overall nuclear matter is equally dense in all the nuclei and the density of this nuclear matter is 1.45 into 10 to the power of 14 grams per centimeter cube which means 1 centimeter cube of nuclear matter weighs 10 to the power of 8 tons and this density is extremely high when compared to matter density that we know of. Now let us see how strongly the nucleons are held together in the nucleus. It is known that the mass of the nucleus is always less than the total mass of the neutrons and protons that make up the nucleus. This mass difference between the initial mass of the neutrons and protons that form the part of nucleus minus the mass of the nucleus is called the mass defect and this same mass defect converted to energy using Einstein mass energy relation E is equal to mc square is called binding energy. The binding energy can be defined as the minimum energy required to break the nuclei into its constituent nucleons or other way around the energy released when the nucleus is formed from its constituent nucleons. Let's take the example of helium-4 to understand it better. Helium-4 is made up of two neutrons and two protons and mass difference between the sum of the mass of two protons and two neutrons minus the mass of the helium converted to energy in this case 28.2960 MeV is the binding energy of helium-4. Similarly, binding energy can be calculated for all the nuclei and binding energy per nucleon is an indirect measure of relative stability of the nucleus and the nucleus which have high binding energy per nucleon are available more in nature. If you look at the binding energy per nucleon variation with mass number of all the naturally available nuclei, it is seen that with the increase in mass number, the binding energy per nucleon initially increases rapidly and attains a maximum value around iron 56 and after that the binding energy per nucleon slowly falls off and most of the nuclei that are available in nature have the binding energy between 6 to 8 MeV per nucleon. I have mentioned earlier that the binding energies dictate stability. Now let us look at the same concept in terms of mass excess values which is again related to binding energies. Mass excess value can be calculated as the actual mass minus mass number in MeV. Since we have already defined that the binding energy is the difference in the mass of the nucleons and the mass of the nuclei, the same can be translated to the difference between the mass excess value of the nucleons and the mass of the nuclei because mass number is already conserved. That is binding energy is higher if mass excess is lower and vice versa. Now let us look at the mass excess values of all the nucleon in this three dimensional plot where on the x axis it is the mass number and along the z axis you will have the variation between the neutron to proton ratio as such. Now if you look at the mass excess values, the mass excess values show minima for certain combination of neutrons and protons and on either side of this combination whether they have excess neutrons or protons they show higher mass excess values. Now the nuclei which are having the lowest mass excess value are the ones which are more stable and other nuclei try to become more stable. Now if you look for at the stable nuclei we see that neutron number is equal to proton number up to mass number 40 and beyond mass number 40 the neutron number is more than the proton number and this neutron to proton ratio increases with proton number and the mass number and beyond mass number 209 there are no black dots at the minima in the mass excess values and all other nuclei try to become stable by a process called as radioactive decay which I will be defining in the next slide. As mentioned the nuclei try to attain the maximum binding energy and wherever 
they are not having the optimum binding energy they undergo a process called as radioactive decay now radioactive decay can be defined as a phenomena where the nucleus of an atom spontaneously and uncontrollably disintegrates with emission of certain types of radiations and this decay rate varies exponentially in nature and the time scale is characteristic of that particular nuclei and all those nuclei that undergo radioactive decay or emit radiation are called radionucleides and based on the types of radiations that are emitted the nuclear decay can be classified as different types for example let's start with the alpha decay alpha decay is the emission of alpha particle or doubly charged helium particle now take the example of radium 226 it gets converted to radon 222 by emitting alpha particle or doubly charged helium nuclei now this process happens because the binding energy of the radon 222 and alpha particle put together is always higher than the binding energy of the radium 226 the other common mode of decay is called beta decay in beta decay either the neutron gets converted to proton by emission of beta minus particle are called as beta minus decay or the proton gets converted to neutron by emitting beta plus particle or positively charged electron or positron or by capture of electron so that the proton gets converted to neutron in all these decays either neutron is getting converted to proton or proton is getting converted to neutron all the radioactive decays result in the release of energy by the way of gain in the binding energy that means the daughter products of radioactive decay are always having the higher binding energy than the parent let me explain with an example how the nuclear are undergoing radioactive decay to achieve maximum binding energy take the example of all the nuclei having mass number 75 now start with zinc 75 which has high neutron to proton ratio now these nuclei have lower binding energy per nucleon and they try to enhance their binding energy by conversion of neutron to proton and they undergo series of decay till the nuclei is arsenic 75 which has the higher binding energy per nucleon similarly if you take the neutron deficient or proton excess side excess nuclei like krypton 75 they try to achieve this optimum n by z value by conversion of protons to neutrons via beta plus or electron capture decay such that the binding energy per nucleon is maximized so nuclei undergo either beta minus decay or beta plus or electron capture decay to attain the optimum n by z value which gives the maximum binding energy per nucleon some nuclei undergo radioactive decay in their bit to become more stable nuclei are the nuclear having high binding energy some of the nuclei that contribute to natural radioactivity are primordial nuclei these nuclei have formed during the formation of the elements but they are still surviving despite undergoing radioactive decay because this decay rate is quite slow for example potassium 40 and rubidium 87 the next class of nuclei that are contributing to natural radioactivity are cosmogenic origin these nuclei are primarily formed in the cosmic radiation interaction with the nuclei in the stratosphere for example carbon 14 is formed by the neutron interaction with the nitrogen 14 the major contribution to the natural radioactivity comes from the natural radioactive decay series in this series a primordial nuclei undergoes series of radioactive decays to attain stability and all the intermediate members of this series are radioactive hence you call them as natural radioactive decay series let's take specific examples like 4n plus 2 series where the primordial nuclei is uranium 238 which undergoes series of alpha and beta decays to form 206 lead as the end member which is stable and all the members of this series are the intermediate nuclei are highly radioactive and these you call them as 4n plus 2 series because the mass number of all the nuclei in this series can be represented in the form of 4n plus 2 
Similarly, you have 4n plus series where the primordial parent is 232 thorium and the end product after series of alpha beta decay is 208 lead. Similarly, 4n plus 3 series where the starting member or the longest lived primordial nuclei is uranium 235 and it undergoes series of decays to form 207 lead. These all three constitute the so called natural radioactive decay series and the intermediate members of the each series are highly radioactive. Besides natural radioactivity, the radioactivity can also be artificially produced by the way of nuclear reactions where the stable targets are bombarded with energetical particles to produce radioactive elements. For the example, nitrogen 14 and bombardment with alpha particles gives oxygen 17 which is radioactive. This is also called as artificial transmutation and discovered by Irene Curie and Frederick Juliet in 1934. In short, Stable nuclei can be converted to radioactive nuclei by changing the neutron to proton ratio by bombarding with neutrons or protons because the stable nuclei have optimum neutron to proton ratio and any disturbance caused will lead to radioactivity. For example, all these reactions given here like iodine-127 bombarded with neutrons gives iodine-128 which is radioactive and so on. Similarly, different projectile and target combinations can lead to radioactive nuclei and large number of reactions have been carried out to produce many nuclei and nuclear fission is also one of the modes where large number of radioactive nuclei are produced. While talking about the primordial nuclei, I have mentioned that despite being radioactive, they have survived because their radioactive decay rate is quite low. To quantitatively compare the decay rates of various nuclei, we require few terminologies to be understood better. So for that, let us try to define few terminologies related to radioactive decay kinetics. Each nuclei of the same kind has same probability of decay in fixed interval of time. Thus the rate of decay is proportional to the number of atoms or minus dn by dt is proportional to n are the number of nuclei. If we remove the proportionality constant, the rate of decay is equal to lambda into n and this is not constant with time because n is also varying with time. This lambda n is also called as activity at that instant of time. Separating the variables and integrating, we see that the number of nuclei reduce exponentially with time and similarly the activity reduces exponentially with time where n0 and a0 correspond to number of nuclei at zero time and activity at zero time. If the activity is measured per unit mass you call it as the specific activity. The units of activity are either Curie or Bacquerel, Bacquerel being the SI unit of radioactivity. 1 Bacquerel is equal to 1 disintegration per second or disintegration per second, number of nuclei disintegrating per second. Whereas 1 Curie is 3.7 into 10 to the power of 10 disintegration per second or Bacquerel and this value of 3.7 into 10 to the power of 10 dps is the specific activity of 226 radium discovered by Curie and this is used as a another standard unit. We have seen earlier that the number of nuclei reduce exponentially with time. A more quantitative way of comparing the decay kinetics of various nuclei is via the quantity called half period which is characteristic property of a radioisotope and is defined as the time needed for half of the given atoms to disintegrate. Since the number of nuclei vary exponentially with time, when n is equal to half the initial amount then the time is called T half or the T of can be calculated as 0.693 by lambda using this expressions. This T half or the half life is independent of any other external characteristics and is only dependent on the nuclei. And if you see the variation of number of nuclei with time, they vary exponentially and with each half life, the number of nuclei gets halved. After n half life, the number of nuclei become 1 by 2 to the power of n. But quite often 
the number of nuclei is difficult to be measured and we end up measuring the activity which is again related to number of nuclei as n lambda and even by monitoring the activity as a function of time we can get the half life the activity after n half lives also varies as 1 by 2 to the power of n as shown in these two graphs we have seen in the previous slide that the activity of a nucleate reduces exponentially with time but what if that decay doesn't result in a stable product but that product again further decays in such cases there is a competition between growth and decay of the first daughter product hence its radioactivity doesn't reduce with time but it increases with time initially because the formation rate of the daughter is more than its own decay rate and it passes through a maxima the profiles look something like this in the figure where the parent decay exponentially reduces whereas the daughter initially grows and reaches a maxima and then starts reducing and the point of maximum activity can be calculated based on the half lives of the parent and daughter using the formula given in this staying with the successive decays the actual decay profiles that you observe are dependent on the relative half life of the parent and their daughters let us take these two scenarios as the specific cases on the left it is shown the case of two half lives where the parent is long lived when compared to the daughter and the parent is roughly 10 times long lived in such cases the activity of the parent you can see that it reduces exponentially with time please note that the y axis is logarithmically scaled hence this exponential is appearing as the linear whereas the daughter activity initially grows reaches a maximum value and then reduces after long time you would see that the parent to daughter activity ratio is constant hence you treat it like a radioactive equilibrium or other way around the daughter activity reduces with an apparent half life of the parent rather than its own half life it is one of the important characteristics the other is that the radioactivity initially increases with time rather than reducing and take the next case of so called secular equilibrium in this case also the initial parent is long lived when compared to daughter but the parent is so long lived that its own reduction in activity is not really observable in our observation time hence the parent activity appears as if it is constant with time whereas the daughter activity increases and reaches a saturation value which is equivalent to that of the parent activity or the overall saturation activity is double the initial activity even in this case the activity has increased with time and reached a double the value and the example of natural radioactive decay series fall under this category where all the nuclei in the decay series are in secular equilibrium with the primordial nuclei and each of those daughters contribute equally to the radioactivity and also they are surviving because they are in secular equilibrium with that primordial nuclei that i was referring to earlier let's try to summarize the implications of the different equations that we have studied so far members of the radioactive decay series are in secular equilibrium with the longest lived starting member in the wars of uranium and thorium etc the daughters are in specific proportion to the parent so that their activities are equal a freshly prepared uranium or thorium is less radioactive than the older one because the older ones have the contribution from their daughter products the amount of the daughter products in such materials gives an indication of the time when it was chemically processed last in ores the amount of the end products is also dependent on the age of the ore in the case of all naturally occurring radioisotopes one of the two scenarios has to be true either those radioactive isotopes have, are to be long lived or primordial in nature or they should have a production route like either cosmogenic origin or being in equilibrium with the 
primordial nuclei are in the case of secular equilibrium. We have earlier seen how the variation in binding energy are responsible for the nuclear decays. Staying with the binding energy, now let us see how this binding energy is dictating the energy released in fission and fusion processes. The binding energy per nucleon as a function of mass number is given here and it is clearly seen that fusion of the lighter nuclei results in the formation of the products with higher binding energy per nucleon and similarly breaking of the heavier nuclei like uranium also results in the formation of nuclei which are having higher binding energy per nucleon. That means both these processes result in the release of energy. Quantitatively we can see in the numbers here. First take the case of nuclear fusion. The mass of deuterium and tritium put together is always higher than the mass of the helium 4 and neutron and this loss in the mass appears as the energy release or gain in the binding energy due to the formation of helium 4 which is 17.6 MeV per fusion of these two nuclei. Similarly, in the neutron induced fusion of uranium 235, the daughter products have lower mass or higher binding energy when compared to the uranium 235 and this mass loss appears as the energy released in fission event which is nearly 200 MeV per fission. The energy released in nuclear reactions like fission and fusion is due to the formation of nuclei which are having higher binding energy per nucleon or where the nucleons are more strongly bound together. Whereas the energy released in chemical reactions is due to the formation of stronger chemical bonds than that are broken. Accordingly, the energy released in chemical reaction is 10 EV per molecule whereas the energy released in nuclear reactions like fission is 200 million electron volts per atom. To take these numbers in perspective, for example, combustion of methane gives about 890 kilojoules per mole, whereas the nuclear fusion gives 10 to the power of 9 kilojoules per mole, whereas the nuclear fission gives an energy of 10 to the power of 10 kilojoules per mole. Staying with the fission of uranium, Uranium has two major isotopes, uranium-235 and uranium-238 and uranium-235 is only 0.72% and this is the isotope that is responsible for nuclear fission in the reactors and the energy release and this is also called as fissile isotope which means that it can undergo fission even with the thermal neutrons whereas uranium-238 doesn't undergo fission with thermal neutrons. Why this variation between these two isotopes and the answer lies in the small variations in the binding energy between the two nuclei which I will be discussing in the next slides. Before trying to understand why uranium-235 undergoes fusion with thermal neutrons while uranium-238 doesn't, let us try to understand the process of fusion a bit more deeply. In the process of fusion, the nucleus initially deforms, forms a neck and breaks the neck and becomes two nuclei. In this entire process, the surface area of the nuclei increases which is not so favored whereas the inter-nucleon repulsion among the nucleons decreases which is favored. So as a competition between these two processes, one favoring the fission, the other preventing the fission, a barrier appears in the path of fission and the nucleus has to cross this barrier to undergo fission. If you look at the variation in this barrier as a function of different mass numbers, initially around mass number 100, the fission barriers are so high that it cannot be crossed easily or it is very difficult to induce fission in them. In the mass region of 300, the fission barriers are so low that they undergo fission instantaneously or without much external stimuli. Whereas in the intermediate mass region, the fission barriers are small that small perturbations can be caused so that the nuclei will undergo fission. 
and when we look at the energy released in the fission that also increases rapidly with the a or mass number and it is negative or energy is not released in the fission of zinc 64 whereas it is very small in the fission of molybdenum 100 whereas in case of iridium 238 very large amount of energy is released now let us come back to uranium 235 and uranium 238 and understand how the small variations in fission barrier and excitation energy are dictating fission processes. Take the example of neutron induced reaction on uranium 235 forming uranium 236. The last neutron binding energy appears as the excitation energy of the uranium 236 and the excitation energy is 6.4 MeV. Now the fission barrier is 5.7 MeV in this case or the excitation energy is good enough to cross the barrier and lead towards fission in this case. Now take the example of neutron bombardment on uranium 238 forming uranium 239. The last neutron binding energy here is 4.8 MeV which is lower than the fission barrier or the thermal neutrons cannot induce fission in uranium 238. Now, if you see at these numbers, you see that the variation in the fission barrier between uranium-236 and uranium-239 is small, but the last neutron binding energy is lower in case of uranium-239. This difference could be understood in terms of the neutron pairing, which favors the stronger binding. Now, in case of uranium-235 becoming uranium-236, the odd neutron is getting paid by the captured neutron or resulting in the formation of nucleus with even number of neutrons. Whereas in the case of neutron bombardment on uranium-238, the resultant nucleus is having odd number of neutrons. Hence, the last neutron binding energy is marginally lower. Now, this difference of 1 MeV says that you can always induce the fission on uranium-238 by bombarding with neutrons of having kinetic energy of at least 1 MeV. This small variation in the excitation energy because of the formation of odd neutron nuclei is responsible for not having fission with the thermal neutrons in uranium-238. Similarly, you would see that the nuclei like uranium-233 and plutonium-239 undergo fission with the thermal neutrons. In the neutron induced fission of uranium-235, besides the two fission fragments, neutrons are also emitted and these neutrons can further cause fission in uranium-235 and lead to chain reaction. And the important points to be noted in this reaction are that in uranium-235, each fission event need not lead to the formation of same combination of nuclei or the fragments could be different. And the average number of neutrons per fission is 2.41 and 3 shown is only for representation. And at least one neutron should be available for the next fission after accounting for the losses so that the chain reaction can be continued. And this sustaining the chain reaction is so difficult that the neutron economy dictates the choice of fuel and the moderator in the reactors. Whenever natural uranium is used as a fuel, heavy water is used as the moderator or thermalizer of the neutrons because it moderates neutrons without much loss in the number of neutrons. Whereas wherever the normal water has to be used as the moderator for neutrons, the fuel has to be enriched in uranium-235 content. As discussed previously, the neutron induced fission of uranium-235 need not break the nuclei always into the same fragments and various combinations are possible. Accordingly, different fission fragments can be formed in different yields and the relative yield of different fission fragments formed are given. Now, one of the important points to be noted here is that these fission fragments have high neutron to proton ratio when compared to the nuclei with maximum binding energy per nucleon in this mass region. We have seen earlier that the binding energy per nucleon is maximum per certain combination of neutron to proton ratio. And this neutron to proton ratio which have higher binding energy per nucleon is 
higher beyond the mass number 200. So when uranium-235 is breaking on bombardment with the neutrons, all the fission fragments formed have high neutron number when compared to the nuclei with maximum binding energy per nucleon in that mass region. Hence, most of the fission products undergo series of beta decay to attain stability or indirectly the most of the fission fragments that are formed are radioactive and undergo beta minus decay. To summarize, the radioactive decay is to gain in the stability and binding energy. The nuclei with optimum neutron to proton ratio are only stable and any change in this neutron to proton ratio from the optimum value results in radioactivity. The energy released in radioactive decay, nuclear fusion, nuclear fission is the result of gain in binding energy of the products and the subtle variations among the binding energy of the nuclei results in the variations in various nuclear processes that are discussed earlier. Radioactivity in nature is either due to unstable nuclei formed when the earth is formed and still surviving like primordial nuclei or nuclei that have continuous formation mechanism via the cosmic interactions or the natural radioactive decay series or else the man-made nuclei with disturbed neutron to proton ratio via transmutation and fission. It is not easy to propagate the chain reaction and it takes lot of effort to sustain the chain reaction. Thank you for your kind attention. Hope you have enjoyed this lecture. In case of any further queries, you can email to Indian Nuclear Society at gmail.com or post to me directly. To listen to the other lectures from the Indian Nuclear Society, please subscribe to the channel.